This is the Trident Disabilities audio archive recording, Wonder and Pleasure in the Eau du Lof of Amsterdam, by Angela Van Halen, published June 14, 2023. For almost 250 years, a mysterious pleasure park sat on the banks of Amsterdam's canals. Angela Van Halen leads us on a tour of the body fountains, disorienting maze, and mechanical androids in the Eau du Lof, an attraction that mingled pagan, Protestant, and imperial desires. Below this is an image drawing of Willem Hecking at the Eau Lofts Sculpture Gallery from 1860 and it includes many people, some featured on stairs with plenty of buildings in the background, all sitting on a cliff. For those traversing the bustling streets and waterways of 17th century Amsterdam, the gardens at the corner of Prison Grot and Louis Grot were heard before they were seen. The Oudulof, which means Old Labyrinth, was located at the edge of New of Newtown, an urban expansion begun in 1610. Prinsengrat, the outermost of the newly dug ring of canals, the Grat and Gordel, linked the city to the countryside and connected the rivers Amstel and Ilstel, the main transport routes in and out of the city. This made Prinsengrat one of the busiest arteries. The canal was filled with boats, and its quays were lined with markets, warehouses, and businesses, including numerous taverns and inns, many catering to international visitors. Something extraordinary in this noisy landscape was needed to interrupt quotidian circulations. A blast of trumpets, pipes, and drums at the corner of Lewis Grotz assaulted the ears, directing attention to a portal theme. The inscription above the entryway to the Udulof mimicked the voice of a street crier whose job was to attract customers. It commanded, don't just stand in front of this door, walk in. Pausing at the threshold, the passerby heard, rather than saw, the promise of attractions within, the play of a fountain and organ music, as well as tiny bleeding and chirping, punctuated by the chiming of bells. There was laughter and chatter, but also startled screams, as the tinkling of delight mingled with sh- terrified shrieks. Below this is that very door, inviting, and it's captioned J.M.A. Reek, Door of Duloff of Prison Grot and Louis Grot, from 1863. It includes a blue door surrounded by a tan walkway with bricks in the background and a window above the door. Those who heeded the doorway's inscription would have passed through the portal into the spacious t- terrace of a tavern. Shaded by trees, the courtyard offered places to sit and enjoy glasses of wine or beer. Souvenir pamphlets were on sale. The visitors could peruse one to get an overview of the site's attractions. The title page from 1643 features an image of a round hedge labyrinth and promises to explain various artful works whose movements were driven by clockwork as well as beautiful fountains, the triumph of Bacchus and Aurelian, and some appealing life-size statues of famed kings and princes of the century. All of this could be seen in the Eau Lof of Amsterdam where more and more improvements are made yearly. Visitors thus discover themselves in an art park and pub, the Triumph of Bacchus. No other European city had public urban labyrinth gardens of this sort, whereas in Amsterdam, five expedition spaces called Duhlhoven were established in the first half of the 17th century. The Eau du Lof was the longest lived remaining in operation for close to 250 years, from around 1620 until 1863. Extent, publicity, and commentary made it possible to recover the sequence of its exhibitions. The first work encountered on the proposed route through the site was the extremely beautiful fountain of the Triumph of Bacchus and Aurelian, situated in the center of the main courtyard. The fountain does not survive, and we mainly know about it from various travel accounts. Civic cities of Amsterdam and the guidebooks, some of which include an engraving by Peter Holstein. Holstein's image shows an elaborate group arranged on top of a grotto surrounded by a moat. To either side of the main work are two basins that discharge vertical streams of water, strong enough to suspend a ball and a crown. There is also a pronged candlestick that spurts water, and in the foreground multiple jets of water spout up between the pavement stones. Standing at the center of the sculptural ensemble is Bacchus, na- naked except for a girdle and wreath of vine leaves. He holds a goblet and a bunch of dripping grapes. Ariand sits before the wine god, 
though she is fully clothed, high arcs of water appear to spray up from her breast. Also featured is Bacchus's chariot, chariot, pulled by two leopards, riding inside is a chubby puto, drinking from a flute, astride a wine barrel. Below this is an image of that fountain, including everything previously described. It was high up with arches, arches on the bottom, and a fence surrounding with reeds on it as well. This reads, engraving by Peter Holston, titled Triumph of Bacchus and Arian, from 1648. As spectators stood near the Bacchus and Arian fountain, peering, perhaps, at its lubricous aspects, they unwittingly activated another set of artful waterworks. Trick fountains installed under the pebbled walkway around the sculpture group would suddenly spurt up jets of water, drenching who, those who stood there. Many sources assert how comical and pleasurable it was to see how the women and young girls who stood gawping at the fountain sculpture were surprised by cold water, suddenly spraying up their skirts. They scream and hop about like newborn calves, chortled Tobias van Domseler from his 1665 History of Amsterdam, which includes a lengthy description of the Duhoff's attractions. The commentators described the soaking of female victims. They did not recount their own unguarded reactions and undignified movements of those of other men, even if their lusty observations do reveal how their passions were stirred. If fountains provided the interpretive key to the larger program of a garden, then the Eau de Lof's triumph of Bacchus in Orient animates a space of Bacchic license where artistic creation and festive behavior were asserted in a triumphant reinvention of pagan rites. The confluence of the divine and the mundane in the Bacchic fountain operated with its immediacy. Its impact was instantaneous and direct as if Bacchus really was present in his work, and his ancient godly powers flowed from the fountain into its contemporary audience of tavern-goers, thus transforming them. Alcoholic drinks, or spirits, were in fact thought to contain a measure of liquid, geest, which means lively or creative spirit. An excess of spirits, like an excess of alcohol, inspires wit and laughter, important to the inventive process and creative pleasures, involved in the making and interpretation of works of art. Yeast was also thought to be present in bodily fluids, especially semen. Human procreativity was a spiritual force. The salacious sprays at Bacchic waterworks thus signified and stimulated creative release through the ecstasy of sensual gratification. Fertility and creativity commingled as the spurting fountain penetrated its viewers. Below this is an anonymous drawing after Cornelius's for its Van Brecken Road, titled Fountains of the Oud du Lof, from 1622. And it features the fountain in the courtyard, surrounded by a fence, with that fence extending along to the left side of the image, where another fountain arrives, with a tree coming out of the top of it, and a maze hanging on the wall in the back. The spirited arousal of human beastiness was pre preparation for the next part of the itinerary, which was to move on to the garden's hedge maze. In winding their arduous way from the center, participants took on the role of another character, Theseus, the hero who confronts the monster in the maze. In the ritual performance prescribed by the discordant accords of this strange exhibition site, the loosening of limbs and unleashing of passions prepared initiates for their entry into the controlled chaos of the labyrinth, where they would encounter the beast within. The Pagan and Protestant Labyrinth The ritual itinerary of the Uzulof unfolded with ever-increasing sensory disorientation. Spatially, this bewilderment was experienced as a constriction. Visitors were lured from the broad street and canals of the new town into a boisterous tavern yard where their senses were assaulted by the liquid refreshments of the cunning Bacchus. Then, for a small admission fee, they entered a second enclosure to be trapped by the tight constraints of a tricky maze. Translated literally, a Dulhof was a wandering courtyard, a bounded space that encompasses the possibility of a straying endlessly along meandering paths. Walkers are at liberty to roam where they will while imprisoned within its green walls. While enjoyable, there is also an element of madness or dull heat. The winding ways of Dulhof are designed to create confusion, 
which is heightened for wanderers already tipsy with drink. Below this is two images, the first one being a skyward down image of the maze in the courtyard, and it is dated from 1870, depicting how the Udulov supposedly appeared from above in 1625. In the top middle is the maze, with the courtyard in front of it and an empty space to its left. There is a street coming down diagonally, and there's a street to the right and the left of the maze as well. Below this is an image of the maze in general, and this time it's round instead of square, unlike the previous image. This one is captioned, Etching of a Maze, used on the title page of a guidebook about the Oud de Lof from 1648. Amsterdam Duhlhaven was the first known civic mazes that were multicursal. Previous public labyrinths, chiefly designed for churches and town halls, were unicursal. There was a single way, and by conforming it to this, the seeker was led to the center in a contemplative quest for truth, self, and God. The labyrinth at Charles Cathedral is the best known example of the unicursal. In the context of the cathedral, labyrinth traders proceeded to the center of secure knowledge of their passage unfolds within the artful plan of higher power. While unicursal labyrinths appear mainly in religious contexts, multicursal hedge mages, such as the ones in Amsterdam, were primarily features of private pleasure gardens and were associated with the myth of Dridideus and Creden Labyrinth. In contrast to the former type, the multicursal maze issues a perplexing challenge. It can only be resolved by actively trying and failing in an arduous process of wandering, erring, hitting an impasse, turning back, choosing a different track, and so on, and the repetition of the process devised to make walkers lose faith in their own misguided efforts. In his Civic History of 1664, Philip von Ziesen writes that in Amsterdam, Dulhaven, the senses were lost and the eyes unable to comprehend. The inability to trust the senses may cause frustration and failure, but this experience can lead to deeper understanding. In the battle to decipher a complicated maze, it is useful to have the help of a guide, like Arian's Clue of Thread. This aspect of the classical labyrinth, the need for guidance, was given moral meanings by scholars such as the reformed pedagogue Jan Amos Comenius and the poet Francis Quarles. In Comenius's popular work, The Labyrinth of the World and the Paradise of the Heart, published in the 1620s, he exhorts that without a guide, the defeated maze warrior is doomed to wander and grope about it without ever finding his way out. Quarles' 16835 English edition of the popular emblem book Pia Desideria by Antwerp Jesuit Herman Hugo adapts the labyrinth to emphasize reformed understanding. The emblem's image shows a pilgrim walking atop the iconographically unusual raised path of the maze. The motto exhorts that when human will and ingenuity fail, we must turn to God to find our way out. Below this is two images of a page. On the left one is an engraving by Boteus A. Uh, Bossuert, captioned by Psalm 119.5 from around 1624. The Latin translates as, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statues. It includes an image of a man facing to the left with a cane held out in a maze on the background. On the right is a mirror image of this, and it reads, Frontispiece of the Emblem 2, Book 4 of Francis Quarles' Emblems, from 1635, after an engraving by Boteus uh, Bossward. The Oud-Duloff maze no doubt was open to the sort of reformed interpretations offered by Comenius and Quarles. Indeed, this religious view would have been an effective way to answer potential crit critiques from church leaders about the revival of paganism at these sites. Those well-versed in Calvin's theory, theology would know that the reformer himself often compared the seductive pleasures and errors of the world to a labyrinth and advocated reliance on God. And yet, worldly delight can never be entirely repudiated, or else there would be no earthly life. In Holwick, from 1625, one of the best-selling Dutch books of the 17th century, Jacob Katz describes entry into the maze as a rite of sexual initiation. 
The challenge, as articulated by Katz, is to negotiate this overly passionate stage of life and to the safe haven of marriage at the center. The Duhoff der Kalverind designs the early phase of love, when young people are stirred by the strong and conflicting emotions of Calverland, calf love. Below this is another page, with the left side being the title page of the first part of Jacob Katz's Holwick from 1625, depicting the labyrinth of calf love, with the maze and fountain in the center of the page and the title at the top. On the right page is the title page of the 1648 guidebook to the Oud Loth of Amsterdam. It includes a maze on the bottom center picture with the title and description at the top above it. Descriptions of how the Oud Loth's fountain made women hop about like newborn calves no doubt were in reference to Kat's well-known writings about the Duloth of calf love. The title print image of a 1648 Oud Loth guidebook depicts a round maze with a pavilion at the center, similar to the one in Kat's books. The number of strolling couples walk toward her into the maze, and behind it is a row of distinctive two-tier trees that evoke the maypole. After the unleashing of passions in the tavern yard by Bacchus, visitors enter the pleasurable constrictions of the green labyrinth. Kat's evocation suggests a conceivable interpretation of the Duhoff labyrinths, which reinvigorated ancient fertility rites within tight moral restraints. Struck down by the android. Eventually, the maze unwinds, pulling visitors along a path to a door that opens into a large building, the sculpture gallery. It is as if the sobering test of solving the maze was a rite of preparation to attain an appropriately receptive state before proceeding into the building. Visitors were ushered from the open-air garden with its noisy crowds of exuberant customers, aggressive spreading fountains, and incarcerating green hedges into a dim interior that must have seemed calm, dark, and quiet at first. This gallery was somewhat like the innermost sanctuary of, the, of a temple precinct, where the most powerful and awesome effigies are kept. The physical movements of the spectators were curved as they took their places in rows of tiered seating facing a curtain stage, much like in the theater. Accompanied by organ music, the curtains parted to reveal performances in which each image moves and acts as if it lives, for the wonder and delight of onlookers. Below this is two images, the first one being a drawing of the Oud Duloth's sculpture gallery, including Goliath by J.M.A. Reek from his Oud Duloth Diverse Sketches from 1862, and it includes Goliath in the back right corner of the building, with many people below him watching and observing along with buildings along the left going down the street with giant figures on top of one. Below this is an incomplete drawing of the Oud Duloff Sculpture Gallery by J. G. L. Reek from 1861, very similar to the first image, just slightly more detailed, and with only the people in it, with an outline of Goliath in the back. The shows or performances also known as Vuderingen, as they were called, were wondrous indeed. They consisted of three kinds of melancholy, mechanically driven works. The androids were life-size or larger-than-life-size costume figures that looked and moved like human bodies. There were also moving picture shows, miniature stage sets in which a series of animated figures acted out familiar classical, theatrical, or biblical narratives. On display, in addition, were complex astronomical clocks with intricate moving parts. Each work in turn was activated and introduced by a presenter. On a raised stage behind these apparatuses was a row of life-size historical figures in wax, a house of moving pictures. The gallery was a complete pictorial and narrative space, featuring works that apparently came alive. A member of the Autonoma made sounds as the spectacle of lifelike motion began to play. Accounts of the performances enticed with claims that these lively artworks would sing and almost speak, and that animal autonoma would gale of crowds with their crowing, lowing, braying, bleeding, and quacking. The most strangely human of the Udulov's various moving statues were the androids. Predating a pair of animated David and Goliath statues 
was a life-size mechanical figure named Jocko. This work does not survive, but a print of it appears in several of the guidebooks, advertising it as a key attraction. The print days pays particular attention to the figure's pursed lips and wide staring eyes, as well as its hands and fingers. An accompanying description declares that Jockham could play an innumerable variety of tunes on his Mosul, which means bagpipes. While he performed, his head, eyes, and hands all moved as if he lived. Below this is a sketch of a scene from the Oud Dulof by J. G. L. Reek from 1861, in which Jockham places bagpipes at the image's center. In the center, Jockham plays on a chair, which appears almost like a counter, with a small figure to his right. Especially intriguing is how the Dulof exhibits presented the strangeness of the android, which appears both as a lively person and a lifeless thing. The use of non-European costumes set up a dynamic in which European viewers are in command of the exercise machine, presented as a subservient thing that exists for their pleasure. Indeed, according to the Duloff publicity, there was not too much difference between the stranger and the strange machine. The Chinese, claims one booklet, were struck with wonder at the mechanicisms of the work, clockwork here, and could not even understand it, but only gazed in wonder. The slight against the Chinese was a particularly pointed insult, considering that the guidebook texts also recognized China as the subtlest nation in the whole world. The backhanded compliment alludes to the fact that China had exceeded Europe in technological innovation for centuries. By the 17th century, however, European craftspeople had become accomplished automata, automata makers, and the diplomatic giving of mechanical devices became a widespread practice a means to impress and influence foreign rulers with wonders of Western ingenuity. The Dulhoff guidebook demonstrates awareness of such transactions. In fact, its condescending comments about the wonderstruck Chinese were borrowed almost word for word from the writings of the Italian Jesuit missionary, Matteo Ricci, who is credited with introducing European clocks and autonomy from China. In Ricci's word, the clock represented at the court struck all the Chinese dumb with astonishment, for such things had never been seen, nor heard, nor even imagined in Chinese history. In these passages, echoed at the Dulov, the Chinese fell behind Europe into the belated time of the other. Ricci's point was to underline the advancement of Western knowledge by denying the extensive history of Europe's Eastern technological innovation. Exposure to European mechanical inventions, the missionary implied, would move the Chinese forward in time, from astonishment to the enriching philosophical understandings that wonders stimulated. Below this is a page with three figures in three separate boxes, and it captions a detail from an anonymous print of figures in the Udulov, including David on the left and a Chinese figure in the center from 1831 to 1854. There is descriptions underneath each of these, and in the far right image includes a man bending down to hold chests that are locked with lock and keys. Dulhoven thus addresses complex urban transformations as multiple global influences were infiltrating the port city, intensified by the fast expansion of trade routes forged by the Dutch East and West India companies. The spectacles sought to enthrall visitors with marvelously incomprehensible technological innovations designed to strike them dumb with wonder and then through repeated exposure to cure their astonishment and cultivate learning and virtue. As Caspar Barlius summed it up, people from all parts of the world could benefit from Amsterdam's Wedding Chapel Likes market, its knowledge market. The claim that the market had much to teach its visitors in exchange for their trade goods. Exiting the Dulhof. Whether visitors apprehended these sites as especially wondrous or beneficial, of course, is an open question. A French pamphlet published in 1666 overtly ridicules the inflated claims of the Dutch civic descriptions. Titled Description of the City of Amsterdam in Burlesque Verses, the author, author of this situ such cool work uses a pseudonym Jacques Le Curio. This parody of an amateur who visits Amsterdam in search of curiosities singles out the Dulhof displays for particular scorn. 
The author points out that the fraudulent nature of the sites and declares that they are a waste of time and mainly frequented by inebriated Dutch peasants who would get trapped and walk around and around the labyrinth without looking up or down or ever becoming the least bit tired. This derision turns the tables. Instead of curious foreigners being captivated by exhibits in the Amsterdam's marvelous technologies, it is the Dutch who are ensnared, stuck in a meaningless circuit with no self-improvement in sight. On one after the other, the Dulhoven were shut down. The last to close its door was the Oud Dulhof, which was sold in 1862. It was completely demolished, its contents vended at a public auction. It, in an ironic turn of events, however, the Oud Dulhof re, was rebuilt only a few decades after its destruction. Amsterdam hosted the World's Fair for Hostelry and Travel in 1895. In this celebration of tourism, foreign and local exhibition goers were invited to visit the Dutch, past temporary structures erected on Mooslapine behind the Rijks Museum. A souvenir lithogram of the exhibition portrays two highlights of a visit to the Duhlhof at Oud Holland, where visitors could experience the labyrinth. Below this is that very image. On the left with a maze, with a group of people watching from above while people walk through the maze. On the right is the statue of Goliath in wax people to the left of him, with ongoers and viewers at the bottom right. The Udulov thus lingered in time, reappearing as a mock of itself. Its glory days were definitely over, however. The World's Fair village of Udhuholland and similar nostalgic reconstructions of the historical past were disparaged in the press. For an instant, you get an entertaining illusion, but it's not vivid, fulsome life. Ultimately, you realize it is only comedy and exhibition in the middle of modern society. This new generation has become aware of the contrived, the unreal, the deceitful, the fake without a soul. This derogatory reassessment of the Duhoff displays during 19th and early 20th century dismissals of the Duhoven as mere amusement parks for children. The U Duhoff's experimental attempts to reconcile Protestantism with elements of classical paganism no longer make any sense, appearing as an entertaining illusion that is fake without a soul. Once the spirit of ancient ritual was vanquished, the exhibition of living statues at the labyrinth center was reduced to an empty puppet show.